Hello again. So Today, the topic of the session is key debates in multicultural education. So we're going to start with three different positions that people generally take when we talk about the need to um, find different ways of relating to each other. So the first one is the justification that we need to um, internationalize or we need to find ways of understanding other cultures because we need to do business with other cultures. So we need to understand their customs so that we have access to more markets. So that's one perspective on this. The next perspective is that the problem that we don't get along very well is individual ignorance. If each of us agrees that we should respect one another and learn about other cultures, we will be all right. So that's another perspective. This perspective is more based on a humanist um, idea about why we should uh, get along or have different relationships with, with each other. And the third one is uh, that the problem is not individual. It's not about individual knowledge. It is about systemic um, systemic discrimination, basically, and related to social and historical dominance. We need to change how we know, not what we know. So this perspective basically says that more knowledge about other people is not going to change how we feel about other people. More knowledge about other people can actually make the problems of not relating very well to certain people, uh, it can make it actually worse. So today what we're going to try to do is work a little bit on this idea that the problem is systemic and to see using a model how we could use that in teacher in, in, in teacher education or in teaching um, in what kinds of implications it would be that would be for the classroom if we started to think about this idea this last idea in a different way so I'll start with um, in order with this idea that the uh, the ways we think about each other, especially others in other parts of the world, and especially other people who are poor or other people who have um, who, who are different somehow, that this idea is coming from our communities and our histories. So the the ways that we relate to each other are historically situated. Uh, and to try to show that, I'll ask you to do something with me. I'll ask you to visualize a field of corn cobs. So take the husks of the corn cobs out, peel them, and then put them all in front of you. Now, can you see your corn cobs? Now, the next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to compare your corn cobs with the corn cobs in this picture. So whenever I do this exercise, most people see yellow corn cobs. And there's a, there's a reason for that. The yellow corn cob is a corn cob that we are exposed to. But I would like to use this as a metaphor for how the yellow corn cob also colonized our imagination and prevented us from seeing corn cobs that are different from that, that we actually don't know yet. These corn cobs in the picture are from Latin America. There are more than 200 varieties of corn cobs. And there are corn cobs of every different color. But we, because we don't see them, we believe that then all corn cobs are yellow. Now, if we take this as a metaphor for how one way of seeing is universalized as the only way of seeing that everybody should agree with or that everybody should adopt, you see that there are lots of other ways of seeing and of doing things that we don't, we, we can't even imagine. That's why we don't consider. So I'm going to take this metaphor a bit further and imagine ourselves as yellow corn cobs because we have been um, um, socialized and educated into one way of seeing things. So the next slide has two yellow corn cobs. 
and these yellow corn cobs are starting to learn about the existence of different corn cobs. And they are going to have two very different reactions to that. So corn cob B says that, um, says this, I have always been open to all corn cobs. I'm a good yellow corn cob. I really like the pink corn cob. It makes me feel good. But I don't like that purple corn cob. It makes me feel uncomfortable, and what it says does not apply to my life. I wish I didn't have to look at the purple corn cob. Please take it away. And it worries me that the purple corn cob is allowed to annoy me like that. Can't you just send him back to his country or make it shut up? I don't want to listen. I already know what it says, and I don't like it. The next one says something slightly different. It says, I had not realized there were so many different corn cobs. That purple corn cob pushes my buttons. I don't like what it says. But what does my reaction to it have to say about where I'm at or where I come from? How can I listen to the purple corn cob differently? Where is the purple corn cob coming from? What can I learn from the purple corn cob, even if I don't agree with it? And what difference does it make if I listen to myself and to the purple corn cobs I may find on my way? So here you can see that there's a difference between the two responses. And what I would like to suggest today, that this difference is extremely important for our students in the classroom. Because the first corn cob, corn cob B, the first corn cob <laughs> to speak in this slide uh, is, is uh, presenting a very, resist, uh, a very resistant response to uh, different corn cobs. He wants to choose the corn cobs he, he's, he agrees with, uh, but then rejects the corn cobs that he doesn't agree with. And uh, corn cob A, the last corn cob that spoke, is the one who is willing to be walking side by side. He doesn't have to turn himself into another corn cob, but he's open to listen and to negotiate things as he goes along. So he doesn't have uh, a, very, a very strong, definite position. He's able to negotiate that position with others as he encounters difference. So, there are lots of different models that explain the difference. There are different theories that explain the differences of responses here. But I'm going to work today with a theory uh, from Baxter Magoda, which is in the next slide. So Baxter Magoda created a model that explains the differences between the two perspectives in terms of understandings of knowledge. So. She says that how people understand knowledge is going to affect how they relate to difference, to others who are different from them. And what she says then is that there are four different stages of understanding knowledge. Now, I don't like the idea of stages. I don't really, I, I don't think the, um, especially the progression of stages is actually true. I believe that, um, these are contextual spaces that we uh, speak from, that sometimes we go back and forward. So it's not, uh, I don't think it is a one, two, three, and four, as Magoda suggests. I think the model is very limited in that sense. But the model is also very useful because uh, it articulates in a very comprehensible way what, um, what these differences are. So I would like to present this model not as a sequence of progressive stages, but as spaces that we inhabit at different points in time. So she says that stage one, or space one, is a space of dualist or absolute knowing. So the person in stage one, or when we are in stage one, because I think we, sometimes we are there, especially when we get challenged, that's a very secure space to be. Um, it's a space where knowledge and answers can only be right or wrong. So learning is about absorbing the knowledge of experts. 
So in a teaching situation, for example, uh, my students would say, I like it when I'm told exactly what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll be happy. Stage two, uh, Nagoda calls transitional, is a stage where there are doubts about the certainty of knowledge. There's both partial knowledge and partial certainty. Uh, partial uncertainty and partial uncertainty, as well as absolute knowledge. So people at the stage or at, in this space feel confused and do not know what to do. But they understand that there is a problem. They understand that there is a dilemma. And, and they feel powerless to do something about it. Stage three, uh, which Magoda calls independent, is a stage where knowledge is uncertain and relative. All knowledge is uncertain. All knowledge is relative. So there are many possible right answers and many possible knowledges. So people would say that, uh, my students would say, for example, that they have the right to have their own views and ways of doing things. And that um, it's, it's, not, it's not possible to want to change other people or to um, engage critically with things because people have the right to have their own position. And then stage four is the contextual stage for Magoda. It's where knowledge is constructed, provisional, and context dependent. So people would say, I try to relate different ideas that challenge mine. My thinking changes uh, when I do that, and I start to see things I could not see before. So you see that stage one um, would be probably more um, uh, could be associated with a corn cob B, the corn cob who didn't, who wanted to um, look at difference, but be in control of what was good, what was bad for him, and in control of his own identity. And stage four is more associated with corn cob A. Now, what's the what's the what difference does it make in a classroom situation when we have different kids in front of us? So I suggest that the difference is very, very important here. So I'll give you an example of that. So imagine a situation where a teacher notices that a boy repeatedly makes grammar mistakes when he speaks. And then she meets the father of the boy and observes that the father also makes the same mistakes. So if we try to analyze the scenario from each of the stages, each of Magoda stages, you will see that the responses are very, very different. For example, in stage one, the teacher could look at the situation and say, OK, there's just one grammar. I need to correct both the boy and the father. And I will look at the father as an ignorant person who is not educated because he's not speaking the correct um, way in his family. So the whole family um, is kind of ignorant. Maybe the culture where they come from is ignorant as well. And then we start to generalize and, and, and actually feel um, somehow superior to this family, trying to, um, to feel in a position where we can help and, and, or in a benevolent way to help and support, but also to teach and correct uh, in a less benevolent way. So stage one would have a very patronizing attitude, probably, in relation to the boy and in relation to the family. Now stage two would look at it a bit differently. Stage two might be my start to think, OK, so they speak a different, uh, speak the language in a different way. And every home might speak languages uh, in different ways. The problem is that they are bringing this different way to the classroom. And stage two uh, teacher doesn't want that thing to be in the classroom. So stage two teacher wouldn't know what to do because she doesn't want to correct the father. And at the same time, she wants the boy to speak the correct language at school. So probably she would ask somebody for help, like the principal or a mentor. But she would still rely on external expert support. Stage three would have a very different idea about what's happening here. 
she would say that a language, a grammar, are the rules defined by one group of people in society, generally uh, related to class. Too. So these people who define the rules have tried to eliminate other varieties of, um, of the grammar. So she would probably look at the child and the father having a language that is uh, worth keeping as well. So she wouldn't try, want to try to correct the father and the boy, but um, and she wouldn't want the children in the school to believe that there's only one way of speaking. That she would want the children to know that there are many ways of speaking the same language, and that variety, these varieties are actually part of languages themselves. But she would also want the boy to learn um, the standard variety. But she would place more emphasis on opening up the space for more varieties. Stage four, the contextual one, would also want the child to feel welcome and the parent to feel welcome in, 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 into the school with their own languages. But she would also be, understand two different things that stage three might not be so interested in. Number one is that in society, there are more people who think like stage one and who will want the boy to speak one language. So she would put more of an effort for the boy to be able to speak both varieties, the variety at home and the variety at school, or the variety that is expected in certain situations in society, without putting down the language of his father, without saying that the father is wrong. And that's extremely difficult to do. The other thing that this teacher would understand is that in other classes in the same school, the boy would or might find uh, stage one too. The more, the, if, if she would understand that if she just allows the boy to speak the language without understanding the differences, he would get into trouble in another situation. So it's very important that the boy understands the difference. But it's also very important that the school itself understands that there are more languages at the, at, at, in society and in these families. So this teacher would also be working with the school as a leader to try to change the school as a whole to be more welcoming to these families, understanding that by welcoming the families, they have, in, in, by the families feeling welcome, the, fa um, the school has more of an opportunity to give the boy the chance to have both languages, the language of the home and the language, uh, the standard language of society that he could use as he wishes to, um, to acquire social mobility, for example. So I, what I've tried to show is that it actually matters uh, which stage we're using when we are um, problem solving in a situation. But what, what I would like to emphasize here is that it's impossible, I think, because ever, most of the things we have around us are in our stage one, still in our society, and this is historical too. So it's impossible to be in four all the time because we are socialized and educated in one. So what I'd like to suggest is that one comes back all the time for all of us. Yeah, but the the interesting idea here is that if you if you understand the model, you can catch yourself when you're doing one and try to move things along to open more possibilities for relationships. Yeah, one will come back, especially when we're not feeling very well or when you're not very secure, and that happens uh, in different contexts in different times. But when we are able to recognize when our own response is a one response. When we catch ourselves there, we can actually have a choice and do something a bit different. And that's why I think this model, is uh, Magoda's model, is so interesting and so important uh, if we're going to be able to watch our own responses to difference. So what I thought would be useful um, for us to do together today is to analyze some responses of teachers. So what I did in the course uh, for teacher education in New Zealand, so you know that in New Zealand, the main problem that um, exists 
uh, in the educational system is that uh, European um, descendants, European New Zealanders, they have they do very well at school. So they are uh, in the PISA results, for example, they are very high up. And some ethnic groups also do very well at school, like the Chinese. They do very, very well at school. But there are two groups that don't do very well at school. And there is a lot of problems with um, people dropping out and school disaffection amongst these two groups. And these are the Maori, which are the, the, who are the indigenous people at, of New Zealand, and the Pacific Islanders, who are coming from uh, the islands around uh, between New Zealand and, and Australia up north. Um, there, there are, of course, uh, racial connotations to this, and there are different explanations for them not doing very well. So some people explain it as um, there's a problem with these people's families. They don't value education. They are not educated themselves, so on and so forth. Some people put the prob uh, rationalize the problem as a problem of society, that there's a lot of discrimination, racial discrimination in society in New Zealand. And therefore, um, the school is a place where the children experience this discrimination, and they don't want to be part of that. There, is, there are people who say that the problem is with the teachers who are in, in direct contact with the children and who uh, cannot understand what they bring to school, cannot understand these families. It's too different or what the, the school expects from what the families bring. In any case, it's a very contentious topic in New Zealand. And people just uh, generally tend to think about the blame, not in relation to themselves. So in the, co in the course that I was teaching, which was a teacher education course, what I decided to do was to provoke them. So I gave them a text uh, called, uh, you cannot teach what you don't know, white teachers in multicultural schools, because most of the teachers in New Zealand schools are white, when about 20 to 30 percent of the population is not. It's the Pacifica and Maori kids. So I gave them this text, uh, which is very provocative, and that really shakes them up. And of course, they didn't like it. <laughs> and I asked them to write down whatever response they came up with. If they were angry, they should write about that anger uh, in, a, in a learning journal. And we did that for a while. I, I, I used more texts that were provocative. And they started writing their journals. And then we used Magoda to, uh, to analyze their own journal. So they had to analyze where they were at in this um, different stages of the learning process. So I'm going to um, show you some of the journals of the students who they allowed me. Um, I asked for permission from them to use. And then we are going to try to analyze these journals using Magoda's model. So I've asked um, your tutors to give you a copy of Magoda's model uh, to help you see where you would place the learning journal of the student. So remember, they read this text. The, they read a chapter of this book. A chapter challenged them. And this is how they responded. Okay, This is the first one. So the student says, I'm white and I'm not a racist. I treat everyone the same and I do not like when people suggest the opposite. I do not think that I may be part of the problem in any way. I think that the reading is just trying to blame white people for the problems in the world when in fact white people have helped us to become who we are today. We live in a fair and equal society and this is because of what white people have done. Everyone should celebrate that. I will not be ashamed of that. If people have not been properly educated, it's their problem, not mine. If they want to succeed, they need to understand what is right and what is wrong and accept the rules like everybody else. All children need to be taught the European way because it's the only right way that will lead them to success. It worries me that the so-called educated people, like the authors of the text, are trying to throw away a system that has worked well for decades. Now, 
uh, if you want to stop the video now to discuss where you would place this uh, learning journal, this is a good time. So my own analysis of this journal is that it is a stage one because there is a right and a wrong. And um, there's also a projection of an identity. So the, the idea is that the way I see myself is the way everybody else should see myself. And anybody who doesn't see what I see is wrong. So I'm, I'm not a racist. And everybody else, if somebody says uh, something different, they are wrong. And um, there's also this idea of um, that we as a people, like uh, the whole world, the whole humanity, is heading towards this progress that she already or he already knows what it is. And that white people are heading humanity and other people are lagging behind. And this is a very common idea when we talk about development, for example, and we've seen that in the other, in the other um, presentation, this is a very common idea. The, the idea, of, for example, that the first world is winning the race and the third world is in the third place <laughs> behind uh, this race for progress, technology, civilization, and education. So this is a very um, widespread idea that actually creates this kinds of hierarchies of who is better, who is worse, and who is um, leading progress who is a position of leadership, who is lagging behind, who is the recipient of help. And this um, text exemplifies it very well. Uh, the other thing in the text that is interesting is that blame is projected on other people. I'm not the problem, it's the other people who are the problem. I cannot see myself as part of, uh, <clears throat> of or what I do as creating any kind of problem. And I'm going to hold on to that because if I lose that, I lose my identity. I lose who I am. Now, if we think about um, a child in the classroom who is different, uh, who is very well behaved, this person uh, might not have any problems with that child because she will be trying to teach the child the right way of doing things. And if the child conforms, there might not be any problem in the relationship. There might be a problem then at home if this child starts to challenge the parents or to feel that the parents are wrong or to, um, to feel himself that he doesn't belong there. But uh, for the teacher, it's really easy to just teach the right or the wrong way. Now, if the teacher faces one of the other corn cobs, so one of the, another different child who actually challenges her, that's where I think the problem begins. Because if there is a problem in the relationship, if the child is not conforming, then this teacher doesn't have any other tool to be able to negotiate her position if she's only in stage one, if stage one is the only thing available to her. So she will look at the child and think that uh, this is really a child who is very different and who doesn't want to conform to what this teacher wants is going to be um, a real, real problem. And then she might um, use then stereotypes, label the child as a problem, and label um, the whole context where the child comes from as a problem as a result of her, her own incapacity to see something different. This, this is what the model suggests, that it's actually, stage one is actually a problem for teaching. And it's a problem for the teacher herself. It's a lack of capacity to engage with the complexity, plurality, and uncertainty, and, and inequality of the teaching process itself. So let's have a look at another one. This one says, I believe I'm already a very open person because I have friends from all races and I get on with all of them. I was brought up to accept people's perspectives and opinions. Everyone I know is just like me. I believe racism is a problem of the past. 
the human race has achieved many things, and one thing, one of these great achievements is equality and acceptance of all races. We have changed already, and it's not very helpful to keep reading texts that say the opposite, that we will still have to change when we have changed already. We all know of all of that already. Why can't we just celebrate the positive things we have achieved? Why can't we forget the past and just move on? So if you want to stop the tape, the, the video now, it's a good time. So my own interpretation of this, and is this is this contestable, is that it's Chiwa number one um, because of this positive identity. And she says that um, she is a very open person. And because she says it, that means she is. And that uh, because she was brought up to accept people's perspectives and everybody else is like her, so you project your own idea onto the others. There's no doubt there that if you're not like me, then you don't fit in my in my scheme. I don't I don't know where to put you, so I I simply ignore you. Um, in this idea of focusing on the future, because there's something very difficult to deal with in the past. So the avoidance and the it's denial, avoidance and deflection that uh, characterize the fear of the unknown or the fear of difference. So uh, the teacher's fear here is justified probably as an unconscious fear of blame. So if I go there and if I look at racism, I'll have to, I'll be blamed for something. So I don't want to go there. So it's a protective measure that, um, that allows uh, people to, to, to hold on to feeling comfortable in the position that they are in. So again, if uh, um, uh, a student who, who, who is uh, different and challenges this teacher, who doesn't agree with her, she will find it very problematic and very challenging and probably will not have, um, if stage one is the only thing available, she won't have the tools to be able to move on uh, and see the, 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 the context differently. I have another one here. So this teacher says, I do, not, I do believe we are all the same under the skin, but I can also see that from the point of view of the author of the text, this could be considered covertly racist. I feel confused by this. I would like to see myself in a positive light here, but it's difficult because the text always challenged me to think about something different, some other angle of a problem that I had not considered before. This is so unsettling. I wish we were told what to do and how to think. I want migrant and Maori parents to be proud of having me in front of their children. So you can stop it here if you want. My analysis of this text is that it is a two because of the confusion. So it can, there are elements of one, and there, there might be elements of three there too, because she's willing to, to move. But um, still, the idea that you want to be told what you think and what to do, and being unsettled by a situation. So you start to see that there is a problem that you may be part of, and that there are these different perspectives, but you don't know what to do. You just, you get paralyzed by the situation. So if a child, a very challenging child, challenges the, the teacher, this teacher, um, she'll probably either ignore him or her or try to ask for help on how to deal with the situation. But it's, a, an, it's not asking for help in, the, in a very empowering way. It's, it's a feeling of disempowerment. I don't know what to do. I'm feeling insecure. I'm going to go and ask for help rather than, uh, OK, we need to work together on this now. And I need help, but I, I also feel strong uh, in this position of asking for help. So let's have a look at the other one here. If people want to be racist, let them be racist. It's their culture, and we should respect that. Everyone should feel comfortable about their own culture. 
culture. We don't have the right to impose anything on anyone. Do you want to stop the tape? My analysis of it is this is an interesting one. Um, it's a three because it sees everything as relative, even racism. And um, it's a very dangerous position to take in this case in, in relation to racism. But most of the teachers who are in stage three actually take an, a very opposite position. They don't want to be racist. So they accept everything. They allow everything. They teach the children that um, there are many different ways. They want the children to feel really comfortable in their classroom. So this idea that everyone should feel comfortable. Everyone should feel good about being in the classroom. And that's great. I mean, it's much better than the one uh, where there's only my way or the highway. But there are also problems in this position because, again, I can create a system that is very welcoming and comfortable inside my classroom and feel really loved and comfortable there. But then when, it, when, when the children go outside into society and into other contexts, I might not give, have given them the tools to actually survive or not get into trouble in these other contexts. So I would say it's a good starting point, but um, we still need to be critical of that. The next one is I have always thought of myself as being very open-minded, but I guess the more I think about it, the more I find assumptions that I need to change. Will I become a better teacher if I open myself up, even if I become more vulnerable? Maybe. At the moment, I don't have all the answers, but I'm willing to keep searching. Maybe there are no clear-cut answers anyway. Perhaps the answers will depend on the context. What this journey means for me as a teacher is that I'm going to have to take more responsibility for the assumptions I have and the way I view other cultures. Becoming a teacher is the first sign of showing that you are someone who gains satisfactions out of watching people learn. I need to gain satisfaction from watching myself learn. You can, you can stop the video for a minute. My own analysis of this is that this is uh, moving towards a four. And this is because of the contextual nature. So, you know, the, the search for the right answer is being interrupted. So she understands that there will be no um, bulletproof <laughs> uh, methodology or lesson plan that will work everywhere. Or uh, there's no um, strategy that I can give her that is going to be safe and work in every context. She will have to renegotiate it all the time. And this is very unsettling. It's funny because this idea that we will find that holy thing, holy grail, that will give us what we need is so ingrained in our culture, in my culture at least. And I often think about it in the way that I think about housework. So I catch myself wanting that to finish something when I do housework. So when I do housework, I work and work and work, and everything that I'm thinking about is that I'm going to finish this, and I'm never, ever going to have to do this again, which is ridiculous. Of course you have to do housework every day or every week at least. So it's, it's part of our desire to uh, be in a comfortable position where you don't have to do the work anymore. And what this, this uh, student teacher is saying is that she's coming to terms with the idea that it's never going to stop. She will have to keep renegotiating and thinking about it all the time because the context changes. And she will have to be watching herself uh, where she's at in the process to be able to open more possibilities for a relationship. So it's much more difficult, time consuming and demanding to do it in this journey. But she's saying it's also very um, satisfying. So you, you start to gain satisfaction out of watching yourself learn. So in this case, if this um, challenging child challenges the teacher, she would be able to stop and think about, OK, so how am I responding to this? 
why am I responding like that? Where am I coming from? Why is this child doing this right now? What is happening here? What is happening with the child today? What is happening in the context of the classroom? What is happening at home that uh, I need to know to be able to support the child to move on and to be able to support myself to move from a very pushback kind of uh, response? So this teacher is in a much better position to negotiate and to think about um, the different possibilities of what to do. She's also in a very different position to work with, with other people to support her. So she can work with the parents in a different way. She can work with other teachers in a different way. She, she can work with other kids in a different way to try to um, negotiate and understand what's going on in the life of um, the child who is challenging her. I have another example. So this example says, I have been brought up in a very closed and sheltered environment, so I know it will be very difficult to leave some of my assumptions behind. I have come to realize that intercultural studies is not about teaching about other cultures or about being politically correct, but it is a journey of self-transformation where I open myself to listen and to learn from other people, even those I wouldn't agree with. We all have a story and a reason for thinking the way we do. I need to learn to ask why. I realize I have been really ignorant and have never thought that other people would see me as dominant. I guess it's similar to hearing people from other countries speak and thinking they have a funny accent when they feel exactly the same, that they are speaking normally and you are the odd one. It worries me that white dominance is still such a huge problem and that I had not realized it before. I have come to understand that applying the principles of this course will not be something that people will easily accept. Do you want to stop the video? Okay, for me this is another example of a move towards four, although there are some things there that could be argued in a different way. Um, what is, I think, interesting about this one is that there is a sense that other people can see you very differently from the way you see yourself, um, in that they may be, they may have a lot, they may be right, you both may be right, um, there, there might be more than one answer to how you see yourself. But this, this student teacher is not threatened by that anymore, whereas stage one teacher would be very angry at anyone who doesn't agree with the way she sees herself. This teacher would say, oh, I can see that from your perspective. That's what you see. And because you don't agree with me, it doesn't mean we cannot be friends. It means that I need to ask why. How is it that you see it differently? How is it that I see it differently too? So there's a reason and um, you can trace back assumptions on both sides. And this teacher shows more curiosity to, uh, to do that, to engage with these things. And therefore, again, in a classroom situation, she's in a much better position to try to figure out uh, why things are happening, to observe with more attention the dynamics of the classroom, the dynamics at home, uh, and the life of this child in order to be able to offer uh, better strategies of support. Um, I think I'm going to move to the case studies. What I thought at this point would be useful is to think about the, the four different stages in relation to um, three different case studies of a classroom situation. So the first one is the case study uh, where a teacher, a very angry teacher, is questioning a child who's different. You put the, it could be ethnically different, it could be different in terms of special needs, but it's, she's very angry and she's questioning this different child who's involved in some trouble. The child stares at the floor and does not answer. The teacher feels that if the child is not defending herself, she must be guilty. And the teacher is about to punish her. Now, 
if the teacher is in thinking or responding from stage one, um, what would happen? What would happen if she's responding from stage two? What would happen if she's responding from stage three and four? That is the kind of um, exercise I would like you to do. So if you want to stop the video, this is a good time. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> so again, for me, if the, the teacher is responding from stage one, you just go ahead and punish. So you believe that your interpretation of the teacher, the child's behavior is the correct one. And then you just punish. And you don't even think twice about it. If you're in stage two, you might be starting to think, OK, there might, there might be something else going on here, but I don't know what to do. So if I punish, I'll feel guilty afterwards because it might have been something else. I'll try to talk to the child, but the child is not responding. So I don't know what to do. I might just give her a warning and ignore it and ignore the next set of behavior because it's something that's too difficult to deal with. Or I might go and ask for help, send the child away to the coordinator or to somebody else who can deal with the problem. So that's a typical uh, stage two uh, response. Stage three would start to ask different kinds of questions like, OK, so where, why is this child doing this? What could it mean? Maybe it means that if she looks at me in the eye, in her culture, in her home, or in her own mind, she's going to be disrespecting me. Maybe she doesn't want to talk to me because there's a break in communication here. Maybe she doesn't trust me anymore. Or maybe she's taking the blame for something somebody else did, and she cannot challenge that other child who put her in this situation. So stage three teacher would be able to actually try to understand the mechanisms that led the child to do what she did. She would also be able to stop and think, OK, why am I so angry? And is there a reason for me to be that angry? And she would be able to trace back why um, the incident has led her to feel like that. And she would also be able to see that in her culture, maybe she's angry because um, the, what she expects the child to do is very different from what a child is doing, and that's what's annoying her. And she would be able to stop that on its tracks. Now, stage four would be an interesting one, because stage four, if she catches herself as being angry with this, she would know she would be in stage one. And then she would say, OK, that's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from all these sets of assumptions that I'm putting on this child. So the anger would probably subside, or you wouldn't be angry when you see this kind of situation. And if it's not working, if the communication is not working, you would already be thinking about, OK, what other kinds of communication can I use to get this child to um, be able to talk about what's happening. Because this teacher in stage four would be really, really interested in how um, to engage the child in the process of understanding with her what uh, has led to that kind of circumstance, of that kind of situation. And understanding the, both where what happened before and the consequences of it. So the whole. Um, focus for a stage four teacher changes from punishing to understanding, mutual understanding. Understanding for the teacher herself of the situation and of her responses and of the possibilities of support of this for this child. And understanding for the child herself of what has happened before, how can we articulate it, what the implications are, and how can we um, negotiate things so that it doesn't happen again in ways that we both feel um, dignified in the process so that we may move on with skills that we can use in society as well. See another uh, case study. A teacher organizes a visit of a police officer to talk to the children. Some of the boys start to talk amongst themselves and look very angry. The teacher asks what the problem is, and one of the boys replies, we do not like the police miss. 
Now, stage one would say, oh, sorry, if you, if you want to stop the video, that now it's a good time to see what response would be from stage one to stage four. So for me, stage one teacher would say, the police is just good. It's here to protect us. You shut up. <laughs> Listen to the policeman. You're wrong, basically. Stage two, a uh, stage two teacher wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> now that the police is there, it's coming already, and the boys don't like the police. It's the kind of situation that just puts you in a dilemma. What do we do? Maybe cancel the police uh, visit, or maybe take the boys out to do something else because you're afraid that the police will challenge the that the boys will challenge the police, and it's going to create a situation that you don't know how to handle anyway, or you would ask for help. Stage three teacher would say, uh, "Okay, why you don't like the police? Um, let's explore what the relationship here uh, is, and see if we can maybe talk to the police and see if he can address." the issues that the boys are worried about and try to present a different perspective from the police. Um, stage four would probably already know that there is a reason for the kid. She would know the kids much better uh, and know that um, if the police comes, it's for a specific reason. She would have already talked to the police to do something that uh, is very, is very uh, responsive to the situation that they have in the classroom. Um, I was once involved in a school project where 30% of the kids were in, the, in that classroom were uh, coming from families with inca incarcerated parents. So it was very interesting to watch and to support the teacher who was um, in front of that class who had a very, very good relationship with the families as more like a, a relative, really, rather than even a teacher. And she knew when there were arrests, because these children saw things that most of our children haven't seen. And she knew that when there were arrests or engagements with the police at home, some of the boys would act out in the, in the classroom. And these were Maori children. So she did work with the police as well, especially with Maori police, uh, in ways that she would bring people in uh, with, with different sensitivities and different understandings to try to create a different kind of relationship with the kids so that they wouldn't see the police uh, as they would see the police in the engagement with their parents. They would see that there are different people in the police uh, in the forest. And there are people who are extremely sensitive as well. That's what she was trying to do, coming from a stage four, trying to um, avoid or work on um, the problems that she, she, from her perspective, that society had created for these kids uh, in a ways that would create for the children themselves other possibilities for the future. And my last case study is the case study of a parent meeting. So in a parent meeting, a teacher encourages all parents of immigrant children to speak the country's language at home with their children. Three of the families state that they cannot do that because they want their children to be bilingual. So if you want to stop the video now. OK. my. Um, my response is that a teacher in stage one would say, OK, if you want to speak your language, you're not helping your children. We want you to help us at school, and they need to speak better if it is English, Estonian, whatever language. And if you're speaking your language at home, that's not good. So it would have a, uh, a deficit view of the, the uh, language at home and of bilingualism. A teacher in stage two would not know what to do because the wishes of the families are different from the wishes of the school. So what do you do when you have that situation? Uh, so again, teacher in stage two would be confused, would ask for help, or would try to ignore the problem and say, OK, do whatever you want. 
A teacher in stage three in this situation would already know that it's important for the child to keep their own language, their own stories from home, and it's important for the child to do um, to to also learn English or whatever the standard language is uh, in the school. So a teacher in stage three would probably leave it and, and encourage the parents to talk in their language at home and encourage the children to talk um, in English or in their language at the school. Teacher in stage one would forbid kids to speak their own language at the school. And this is unfortunately very common. A teacher in stage four would be interesting. I've seen uh, teachers doing very interesting things with this. I've seen teachers in stage four saying, they would say, oh, of course, at home, speak your language. But maybe for some tasks, you could speak the language of the school. And the same at the school. She, the teacher I worked with, she invited the parents to come to the school and to teach their own language to other children, like the basics, and make it really exciting and fun. Uh, this idea of multilingualism and plurilingualism. At the same time, they, they, she also invited them to do certain things in the standard language with the kids, just to show that having more than one language is actually quite cool, and that to model that with the parents and with herself. She learned some words in the language of a child. She taught and asked the parents to teach in the classroom to other children. And she asked the parents also to switch to, to, to turn take and teach things in the, in the standard language. Some parents couldn't speak the standard language very well, so she also got the children to teach the parents some of the standard language, while the parents taught the children other things. So this intergenerational thing was really interesting in this classroom that I watched. But the basic concern was um, to uphold the principle of plurilingualism and of appropriacy uh, in different contexts. Uh, and this, this teacher also worked with the whole school to uh, get the school to welcome and to um, reward plurilingualism. She actually had to stop other teachers from uh, forbidding students to speak their language on the own school grounds. And she created a very interesting atmosphere where um, the language of the home was uh, very much valued. Speaking another language was valued at the same time that speaking the standard language was also valued. So I hope that this presentation helped you see that the, the way we understand knowledge, going back to Magoga, does have um, 